Good morning. One more time. Good morning. morning. Welcome to God's house. Welcome to worship. It's good to see all of you again. I have one important announcement. Uh, Tomorrow, next week, Vacation Bible School starts. And it's a stellar Vacation Bible School, Shine, Jesus, Shine. And we'd like to invite all all the kids to come to that. Uh, registration will be tomorrow morning over in the in the education wing and the in in the gym and uh, they'll take care of you from there if you get the kids that far uh, the rest will be done and it starts at 9 and goes to 1130 registration Registration starts at 830 okay and it's Monday through Thursday okay are there any other important announcements May the Lord bless your worship today as we begin with the opening hymn. Built on the rock, the church shall stand, even when steeples are falling. Crumbled have spires in every land, bells still are chiming and calling, calling the young and old to rest but above all the souls distressed longing for rest everlasting surely in temples made with hands God the Most High is not dwelling. High above earth his temple stands, all earthly temples excelling. Yet he who dwells in heaven above chooses to live with us in love making our bodies his temple we are god's house of living stones built for his own habitation he through baptismal grace us owns, heirs of his wondrous salvation. Were we but to his name to tell, 
yet he would deign with us to dwell with all his grace and his favor. Here stands the font before our eyes telling how God has received us. The altar recalls Christ's sacrifice and what his supper here gives us. Here sound the scriptures that proclaim Christ yesterday, today the same, and evermore our Redeemer. Grant then, O oh God, before your land, that when the church bells are ringing, many in saving faith may come where Christ his message is bringing. I know my own my own know me you not the world my face shall see my peace i leave with you amen please stand in the name of the father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them and I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us, Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, good will toward men. We praise Thee, we bless Thee, we worship Thee, 
we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, your Son Jesus triumphed over the prince of demons and freed us from bondage to sin. Help us to stand firm against every assault of Satan and enable us always to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading from Genesis, the third chapter. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said to him, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the word of the Lord. Second Corinthians, the fourth chapter. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed, and so I spoke, we also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. 
as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the third chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Then Jesus went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He's out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And he called them to him. And said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said he has an unclean spirit and his mother and his brothers came and standing outside they sent to him and called him and a crowd was sitting around him and they said to him your mother and your brother are outside seeking you and he answered them who are my mother and my brothers and looking about at those who sat around him He said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word, this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. The children, please come forward for the children's message. How are you guys today? Good. Good. You guys ever get in trouble? No. Me too. When I, I still get in trouble, but when I was little and I got in trouble, sometimes I would hide. You ever hide when you get in trouble? Yeah, some of you, yeah, okay. We say that we don't want 
our parents to find us after maybe we've done something like broken something, maybe mom's dish or mom's lamp, something while we were messing around in the house. And so we try to hide so that we don't get in trouble. In our uh, Bible reading today, we saw our first parents, Adam and Eve, they got in trouble, didn't they? And what they do? They hid. They went and hid in the garden, among the trees of the garden, and they uh, hoped that uh, God wouldn't find them. They hoped he wouldn't see them. But God knew where they were, didn't he? Yeah. And he went to them. He went to them. And he asked them questions. He asked, uh, where are you? We knew where they were. And he said, uh, we, we were naked and so we hid. God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I told you not to eat from? And then uh, Adam said, well, the woman you gave me, she gave me from that tree. And then God said to Eve, he said, he said, have you eaten up from the tree? And, and she said, uh, the serpent, the serpent tempted me. The serpent told me to eat of the tree. And so they were trying to pass the blame, trying to push off their guilt because, and their shame. And God promised them that there was going to be one who would take their guilt away that there would be one who would crush the power of the serpent, of the devil. And uh, that was going to be from Eve's family, from Eve's descendants, her seed, he would come who would crush the power of the devil. We know who that is, don't we? Yeah. Who is that? Jesus. Jesus. We know that he's the promised one, he came and he crushed the devil's power. Here's a place that you can go to when you sin. That you go to the cross. And you can hide beneath the cross. And you say, Jesus, I've sinned. And he forgives you all your sins. That's why he went to the cross for us. So that we can have forgiveness. So that we can have life. Oh, this is the best hiding place in the whole world. Is at the foot of the cross. We pray. Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for taking away my sins. Thank you for rising to give me new life. Help me to trust in you. Amen. Thank you. We continue with the next hymn. A mighty fortress is our God, a trusty shield and weapon. He helps us.
free from every need that hath us now foretaken. The old evil foe now means deadly woe, deep guile and great might are his dread arms in fight. On earth is not his equal. With might of ours cannot be done, soon were our loss effected. But for us fights the valiant one, whom God himself elected. Ask ye, who is this? Jesus Christ it is, of Sabaoth, Lord, and there's none other God. He holds the field forever. Though devils all the world should fill, all eager to devour us, we tremble not, we fear no ill, they shall not overpower us. This world's prince may still scowl fierce as he will, he can harm us none, he's judged the deed is done. One little word can fail him. The word they still shall let remain, nor any thanks have for it. He's by our side upon the plain with his good gifts and spirit and take they our life roots faint these all be gone our victory has been won the king Kingdom ours remaineth. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning I'm going to give you a little quiz on the Bible, how well you know things from the Bible, especially the Old Testament. I'm going to want you to identify the person to whom God is asking the questions. Okay, number one. Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Cain. Okay, did you get that one? Cain. Uh, second question is a little easier. Why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I think I heard somebody say Abraham. That's right. God asked Abraham those questions. Okay, next one. Who gave man his mouth? Moses. 
Okay, Moses is the answer. Yeah, God, uh, uh, he's speaking to Moses when he was making excuses about why he wouldn't be a good spokesman for the Lord. Okay, uh, another one. Son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel, okay, Ezekiel, in the valley of dry bones. Okay, and uh, got one more here. Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? Jonah, that's right. God asked Jonah that question when Jonah was grumbling about the vine dying that God had given him for shade. Now I have a question for you about God's questions. If God knows everything, why does he ask so many people so many questions? Obviously, God wasn't expecting answers to his questions. He knew the answers before he asked them. When God asks a question, it's for the benefit of the person to whom he's speaking. All the questions that I just quoted were intended to lead an individual to some truth that God wanted him to understand. In our Old Testament lesson, we heard God ask Adam and Eve a series of questions. All the questions had a purpose. God wanted to confront them with their sin and lead them to repentance. He could then comfort them with the promise of a Savior. Although they may be worded differently, we find God asking us the same kinds of questions. He asked Adam and Eve, he has the same purpose in mind. He wants to confront us with our sins and then he can comfort us with a savior. It was a question that led to this mess in which Adam and Eve found themselves when God called to them in the garden. Satan had asked a question of Eve. You remember, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. Once the seeds of doubt about God's love were planted in Eve's mind, a tempter went on to declare, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The father of lies told the truth when he offered that encouragement to Eve to disobey God's command Indeed, she would be like God knowing good and evil, but that would be a tragedy for her and her children after her. Satan's question was intended to separate her from God and lead her to an eternity in hell. God's questions, on the other hand, had a far different purpose. In his grace, his undeserved love, God used a series of questions to expose the sin in the hearts of Adam and Eve. Since they didn't go to God, he came to them. Like a patient parent, God gently led them to see their sin so that they could see their need for a savior. He then provided a promise concerning that savior. Today, a gracious God calls to you and me, the children of Adam and Eve. Through his holy word, he asks searching questions of us. He does this to confront us with our sins, to comfort us with the Savior. Our Old Testament lesson tells the sad story of Adam and Eve's shame over their sin. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? God knew where they were. But in order to confront his creatures with their sin, God brought himself down to their level. He took on a physical form to walk to them and talk with them. Perhaps through that action, we can see a shadow of the time that God would become fully human to undo the damage Adam and Eve's sin caused. Although God would have had every right to quickly return them to the dust from which they had been created, in love he called out to them to restore the relationship with him that had been broken. 
Before we look at the questions that God asks, we must stop and consider the name that is used for God in these verses. Three times he's called the Lord God. The name Lord, spelled in all capital letters, Yahweh, is a translation of a Hebrew word that means I am. When that particular name for God is used in the scriptures, it is almost always used in connection with God's love. When the I am God loves someone, his love does not change. It's lasting. It's everlasting. The Lord's gracious call to Adam began the process of leading all humanity to repentance. He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? God asked three questions. Where are you? Who told you that you were naked? And have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Again, God knew the answer to every one of those questions. So then why did he ask them? Each of them serves as a confrontation to Adam and Eve's desperate denial of their sin. Those questions were bridges that God built between himself and two sinners who were separated from his love. You know the pathetic response that Adam gave to God's questions? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree and I ate it. Although he blamed his wife and ultimately God who had given to him his wife, Adam finally did admit to sinning the one command God had given him. We can imagine that Adam now has some questions floating around in his head. What's going to happen to me? Will God give me a second chance? Before answering the questions Adam might have had, God had a question for the one who was created out of Adam's, Adam's body. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Once again, God's question had a purpose. Adam admitted that he had disobeyed God, although Eve also tried to blame someone else, the serpent. She too finally admitted her sin. God's questions accomplish their purpose. He called to his creatures to confront them with their sin. They were led to see the hopelessness of their sinful condition. In love, they had been given the opportunity to obey God, and they chose not to obey him. With freedom comes responsibility, and they had failed to use their freedom wisely and could rightly expect to suffer the consequences. Where are you? A gracious God asks you and me the same question. Have we been hiding from God? Is there a pet sin that we are protecting in some corner of our heart, hoping God will not see it? Perhaps we're living a double life. Maybe we have become so disillusioned and deceived by sin that we believe we can live contrary to God's commands and he won't notice. Psalm 139 tells us, where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. God knows all and sees all. When he asks you, where are you? He isn't asking because he doesn't know. He's asking because he wants you to think about your relationship with him. Who told you that you were naked? In other words, who has given you a first-hand knowledge of sin? It's Satan, the sinful master under whom we are born, has given us familiarity with sin. Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Oh, wow. What forbidden tree haven't we eaten from? 
We've eaten the fruit of rebellion against God from the whole orchard sin has to offer. Among us, his name has been used to curse and swear. His precious word, which is his name, has not been kept holy in our lives. Who of us has not eaten our fill of the fruit of the self of the of fruit of self-centeredness centeredness? We lust for more and more material things. The bitter fruits of discontentment and dissatisfaction have crossed our lips. Perhaps the question that God asked Eve is more powerful than all the others. What is this that you have done? Yes. What is this that we have done? Let's not point fingers or place blame. Let's save the excuses, the ifs, ands, and buts. Don't hide from a gracious God who calls to you. As he holds you accountable, hold yourself accountable. May we confess as King David did when confronted with his sin, I have sinned against the Lord. Perhaps someone might wonder how confronting us with our sins is the work of a gracious God. Sin destroys the relationship between us and God. It destroys lives and if left in place, will destroy a person forever. Teachers don't ask questions of their students for the teacher to learn. They do it to teach. Police officers don't ask us if we know why they pulled us over so that they can figure out what ticket to give us. They do it to assess our attitude or attentiveness to our driving. Did we even notice that we broke the law? God asked Adam and Eve a series of questions to help them see their sins. The gracious God is still asking sinners similar questions. Today, he asks you and me some questions. Where are you? What is this you have done? Have you broken my commands? He asks these questions to confront us with our sins. What's going to happen now? That was probably the question that Adam and Eve were asking after they saw their rebellion in all its ugliness and when they understood the seriousness of their deliberate and willful disobedience, then they were ready to listen to God. The questions God had asked them led them to look to God for forgiveness and hope and salvation. The account from Genesis continues. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Once again, the inspired writer of Genesis uses that special covenant name for God, the I am. Since Satan used the serpent to bring about this temptation, the Lord commanded the serpent to crawl on its belly as a reminder of sin's entry into the world. And the deceiver who spoke through the serpent, would be crushed by the seed of the woman. That seed of the woman was born in Bethlehem several thousand years later. He has indeed crushed the serpent's head, but he was severely bruised in the process. His victory came at a very high price. To Adam and Eve, God promised salvation instead of destruction, eternal life instead of eternal death a restored relationship instead of one forever destroyed. Through his grace, God led them back to trust that God loved them and always do what is best for them. No, he wouldn't withhold anything good. No, obedience was not a burden for them. It was a blessing. Although Satan would again and again tempt them to disobey God, the questions God asked 
and the promise he made brought them salvation. Events similar to those that occurred in the Garden of Eden have reoccurred many times in every generation ever since. Satan brings ruin and destruction by challenging the truth that God is good and gracious. Humans fall for his lies and deception. But then a gracious God calls to them, where are you? What have you done? He asks questions like these from Jeremiah 23. Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him? Declares the Lord, do not I fill heaven and earth? God's desire through the penetrating questions in his word is to lead people to see their helplessness, condition, and open their hearts to the comfort that he offers through his son. Since God's mercy is new every morning, he calls to us again today. He does this to confront us with our sins so that he can comfort us with a savior. Unless we see what we need, we won't believe that need has been met. When God said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? He did it to warn him that sin was about to take control of his life. God's question to Abraham, is anything too hard for the Lord? was asked in the hope that Abraham would believe that nothing was impossible with God. He and Sarah would indeed have a son in their old age. Who gave man his mouth? God used that question to lead Moses to trust that God would give him the words he needed to speak. Again and again, God asked questions to which he knew the answers. Obviously, those questions served a purpose. In the person to whom they were addressed, they were meant to cause reflection, consideration, and ultimately faith. God's questions to Adam and Eve served that same purpose. He wanted to confront them with their sins so that he could comfort them with the Savior. Today, God asks similar questions of us for the same reason. Where are you? What have you done? Have you broken my commandments? And a gracious God calls to us. He does this to confront us with our sins and to comfort us with the Savior. Now the question is whether or not you and I are listening and are we answering? Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Please stand. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Merciful God, you have sent the promised offspring to crush Satan's head forever by the death of Christ our Savior. As you gave comfort to Adam and Eve, receiving their meager confessions for the sake of your grace and promising deliverance from sin and its curse, so comfort us by the forgiveness of sins and give us hope in the promise of eternal life and your new creation. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, Christ has made us his brothers by his incarnation and suffering for our sake. Fellow heirs of your undivided kingdom, give boldness to those who preach, strength to those who work, generosity to those who give, and patience to those who suffer in your church, that we may always do the will of God and so be true and faithful members of the household of God. Lord, in your mercy, Give courage to your church, O Lord, that as we believe, so we also would speak of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the confident hope we have in him, that we too will be raised and brought into his presence. Embolden us by your spirit to confess this Christian faith from a lively conscience, that for Christ's sake, grace may extend to more and more people and increase thanksgiving to your glory. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, no kingdom divided against itself can stand, and a house divided must fall. Graciously preserve our nation with its government. Frustrate the work of Satan and the seeds of destruction he would sow in every place where he is not stayed by your gracious hand. Unite our leaders and our people for the common good while leading us to hope in that eternal kingdom which is not of this world. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal Lord God, hear our prayers for your servants who suffer in this earthly tent, especially Janet Rocker, Gary Quant, Travis Segabart, and those whom we name in our hearts. Do not let them lose heart, but fix their eyes beyond what is transient to the things unseen. By this slight momentary affliction, prepare them for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, when at last you will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Lord, in your mercy. What was lost in paradise has been regained by the conquering wounds of your Son, crucified and raised again. In him we are restored as your children and made bold to ask for every need. Help us for his sake and in his name, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Bless we the Lord. To God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We sing the closing hymn. Have no fear, little flock. 
have no fear, little flock, for the Father has chosen to give you the kingdom. Have no fear, little flock. Have good cheer, little flock. Have good cheer, little flock, for the Father will keep you in his love forever. Have good cheer, little flock. Praise the Lord high above, praise the Lord high above, for he stoops down to heal you, uplift and restore you. Praise the Lord high above. Thankful hearts, praise to God. Thankful hearts, praise to God. For he stays close beside you in all things with you. The Lord, I have love. 